Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Positive Thinking 101. The learning for this week is dedicated by the Torah Center Silver Donor Ronen Kamenetz for the Refua uh, Shlema of Chaya Bat Chaviva. Chaya Bat Chaviva, and for the release of all the hostages and the victory of Afram Yisrael over her enemies. Uh, also, please have in mind uh, for Refua Shlema for Miriam Bat Liza. She's undergoing a slight surgery right now, and we want her to have a 100% Refua Shlema. Okay, so um, we've spent um, seven weeks over the summer. Uh, we had a lot of interruptions with, uh, you know, Shiva Sabah Tammuz and Tisha B'Av, and then just me just needing to get away for a little bit. Um, we had lots of conversations about this idea of uh, positive thinking, and we spoke about what you may have missed, if you're coming in right now, is we spoke a little bit about, you know, the idea of finding um, positive thinking through your speech, through your imagination, through your thoughts, through your prayers, and so on and so forth. But I think there's uh, one more idea that I want to kind of like drill in today with you, which I think is very important. Uh, and that is the idea of Yeshua Tashem Kehav Ayin, which is that God's salvation can happen in a blink of an eye. Okay, so let's take a step back for a moment. We're in the month of Elul, okay? And the month of Elul is a powerful month for transformation. It is a month of, um, that is uh, symbolic of, uh, of all growth. And therefore, we know that the month is also very much tethered to this idea of teshuvah, the idea of uh, repentance. And we often think that teshuvah means, you know, like self-transformation is an uh, unfortunate translation. But in reality, teshuvah is self-expression. When we talk about uh, the month of Elul, we talk about it in the context of Moshe going up to Har Sinai, spending 40 days up there, beseeching God to uh, forgive the Jewish people at the end of those 40 days from the beginning of Elul until the 10th of uh, Tishrei. God says, Slachti kitvarecha. He finally forgives the Jewish people and brings back Luchot Shniot, the second set of tablets back down to the Jewish people. Um, we don't believe in a linear, linear view of time. As Jews, we believe in a cyclical view of time, which means that every single year when we come back to this particular point in time, we reconnect to every single moment that came before it. And therefore, when we think about our time, you think of it as a spiral coming down, and every year, when we hit a particular time in that cycle of the year, we're reconnecting to that particular energy. And this month, this energy, is this month of Elul, is the same exact month that the Jewish people were standing outside of Israel with Joshua ready to go into the land of Israel. It happens here. The, the, all of Sefer Dvarim, the end of Sefer Dvarim, where Moshe is talking to the Jewish people and giving them that final last pep talk as a rabbi to his, his students. All that is happening in the month of Elul. It's happening right now. The two major battles that happened at the end of Moshe's life, the battle against uh, um, Sichon Melech Heshbon and Og Melech Abashan happens in the month of Elul. Now, those two kings are not just random kings with random names, right? Uh, Sichon uh, Melech Abashan, sorry, Sichon Melech Heshbon and Og Melech Abashan are two very particular type of kings. They were the guardians. They were two kings that were set up to ensure that when the Jewish people would try to enter into the land of Israel, they would be their obstacles. They were, they were planted there on purpose. They knew there was already a Mesorah, even in the non-Jewish world, that one day the Jewish people are going to try to reclaim the land of Israel. So they set up these two kings, very powerful, amazing military men, have very different strengths. Og was this giant, Okay, and Sichon was a brilliant tactician, strategist, who understood the art of war. Now, he was named, his, his, the name of his kingdom is called Melech Cheshbon. What does the word Cheshbon mean? Accounting. A what? Accounting. Very good. So he is the Melech Cheshbon. And so what's preventing the Jewish people from going to the land of Israel? Cheshbonot. All kinds of accountings. Oh, it's too difficult to go in. It's too hard. It's if we're afraid. There's a people there that are stronger than us. It's too complicated. We have to fight to live there. I don't know if I can be comfortable there. It's not an American way, uh, lifestyle. You know, uh, the uh, they, you don't really have uh, you don't really have customer support in uh, in Israel. You have all kinds of challenges, all kinds of cheshbonot that we make that stop us from going to the land of Israel. And Moshe slays that. The way you go into the land of Israel is by breaking down your cheshbonot. That's like a Rav Cook's idea. But he also adds the following. He says, you look at Og. Og was a giant. He lived, uh, he was around during the time of Noach. Midrash says that Og Melech 
was uh, part of the Nephilim. These were the angels that came down to land and uh, were inappropriate, had inappropriate relations with women and had all kinds of children. And Og is one of the offspring of those angels and those that, that uh, unholy union between the, these angels and these women. He was a giant. He was super powerful and he had a special blessing for longevity because he was very involved in helping Avraham with his mission. As a matter of fact, the palit, the person that, uh, according to some opinions, the person that uh, is uh, informing Sarah about Avraham's attempt at sacrificing Yitzchak, the person that went to tell Sarah was none other than Og Melchabashan. And he was infatuated with Sarah, hoping that the news would actually uh, upset her so much that she would have divorced him so that, she, that he, Og, could remarry her. But Abraham understood that, uh, you know, people are people. And Moshe understands that people are people, but he also understood that people have schuyot. And Moshe was afraid to go up against Og because he, saw, he knew that he was helping Abraham and he had some schut of surviving the, the flood and so on and so forth. But what does he do? He lifts up a mountain and he holds it over his head and this mountain has the same width, the floor area of all the Jewish people encampment. And he's ready to take it and throw it and crush the Jewish people. And what does Moshe do? He comes with his little axe, he taps him on his ekev, his ankle, and the whole thing crumbles down on top of him and the whole thing is over. Before we want to go into the land of Israel, okay, sometimes uh, we have these crazy obstacles that stand in front of us. A mountain that seems unsurpassable. Can't, I can't pass it. Impossible. But a little bit of effort, a little bit of legwork, and you see that the tallest mountains become nothing. You know, I've, I've run trips around the world, and my favorite trip to run is like a Euro-Israel trip for beginners. And um, I like to go to Europe first. We'll stop somewhere, anywhere in Europe for a couple of days. And then when you land in Israel, you're exhausted because you're flying from New York, you're landing in Europe, you know, early, usually in the morning, and you have a whole entire day of tr touring, and then you have one night, another day of touring, and then the next night, you fly out and you land in Israel early in the morning, like at four o'clock. So what do I do? I can't get into a hotel right away, so I have to figure out a way of stalling and keeping the group like, awake and, and, and not asking for a hotel. So I prepare them in advance, say, listen, the next day you need sneakers, you're going, to be, you're going to be doing like activities, like it's going to take us time to get to a hotel, we're going to the north. So I drive up to the north, and I take them on a hike to a, uh, on a mountain called Har Arbel, the Arbel Mountain, okay? Um, so Har Arbel is a beautiful, gorgeous, scenic hike. If you, have, if you like hiking, I, t I recommend it. I'm not sure if it's open right now, but Bezrat Hashem, the north will be free soon, and we'll, you'll, we'll, we'll take you guys on that hike. So when you go on that hike, um, you stand at the, you're standing at the, you're driving up the mountain, and it's, it's very intimidating. You're like, they're like, Rabbi, we haven't slept in two days. It's dangerous to take us on a hike right now. I'm like, you're young, you're 20 years old, what are you complaining about? I'm like, you don't have anything to worry about. If you fall, you'll bounce back. I'd be worried about it. I didn't sleep for two days either. So uh, we take them on this hike, and I always have a couple of people that get really upset with me. Usually it's a couple of girls. <laughs> Rabbi, I can't believe you're doing this to us. This is irresponsible. A part of the hike, there is this one area where uh, the only way to go down, because what I do is I drive, uh, I take the bus, they drop us off at the top of the mountain, and the hike is going down. Okay, and there's one section of the mountain where they have these like uh, metal bars and like uh, chains on the side of the mountain, and you're literally standing on pegs holding onto chains, climbing down the mountain. It's not like a terrifying thing. It's like a small area, like 40, I wouldn't put them there. I took my kids on it. But if you're, you know, if you're an American and you're not used to hiking and you're terrified, so one girl's like, Rabbi, I hate you. How could you do this to me? You know, it's, you, this is ridiculous. You know, this is so irresponsible. What if someone dies? There's no, there's no safety net. There's no, uh, just, freaking out, bugging out at me. I'm like, don't worry about it. I promise you'll be safe. So I'm like, you know what I'll do? This is, what I, this is how I calm them down. I've learned over the years. I'll get two of the strongest, handsomest men on my trip. I'm like, these guys are going to make sure that you come down, okay? And they're going to stand on your right and your left, and they're going to hold your hand the whole way down. And that always works. It gets them on, at least it gets them onto the, uh, on the mountain. And then usually what ends up happening is when they finally make it down, and you're looking up, and you know you haven't slept in two days, and you just climb down this mountain, you know what happens? You feel amazing. Often in life, we have these obstacles that feel like they're impossible, and that we just, they get in our way. 
But when we actually conquer them by putting in a little bit of effort, everything changes for us. We become inspired. We grow from it. There is a, uh, a famous story that is told by um, the grandson of Rabbi Akiva Eger. Rabbi Akiva Eger was a uh, very prominent uh, Litvish rabbi, was part of the Mitnagdim, not Hasidut, he was anti Hasidut. And his grandson, Label Eger, actually decided that he wanted to become a Hasid. Crazy. And uh, he decided he was going to join the Kutzker Rebbe, the Rebbe Mikutsk. And um, he goes down, and uh, the family is really upset. So upset that some of the family members tear Kriya. They're like sitting Shiva for this guy. You're going to become a Hasid? You're crazy? Yeah. Anyway, so he spends his first year with the Kutzker Rebbe. And uh, he comes back, and his father says, was it worth it? The whole year, everything you did to our family? What did you learn? So label... Eger says, I learned three things with the Kutzker. Okay, these are the three things he learned. Number one, that there are something called angels and men. Number two, is that men have the ability of being greater than the angels. And number three, he says, Bereshit bara Elohim. And God creates beginnings, but it is men that creates endings. And I love that quote. I love that story. And I think it's so appropriate in context of uh, this conversation because number one is we're in the month of Elul. Uh, Elul is one of the few months in the calendar that actually has a name. It's called Achrit Hashana. It's the last month of the, of the Hebrew calendar. So as it says it, you don't have a name for every year. You have, you have the first month, the second month, you have the seventh month, but you have Achrit Hashana. This month is the last month of the Hebrew calendar. It's the end. Now, we know that God has lots of different names. And the most famous one is yud He vav He, right? So we know that that's an acronym for yi ye ho ve ha ya ho ve sorry. ha ya yi and ho Sorry, yi ho ve and yi ha ya yi and ho Okay? So these three names represent different aspects of God in time. God in the past, God in the present, and God in the future. Now we know that God is infinite. If you were to pick one area in the timeline that God actually is most manifest, where would it be? Present. It's in the present. Now think about that for a moment. The way in which you find God is in the moment that you're in right now. God creates beginnings, and you choose how to respond to the situation that you're in. Now often, we are very much tethered to our pasts. Uh, we're very much reflect, we often reflect on what was and we, um, we forget that sometimes our situations are not just uh, random, they're very specific. And sometimes when things feel like they're falling apart, they may actually be falling into place. We, it's hard for us to see things on the timeline. It's hard for us to recognize that every moment is a moment that is uniquely being catered by God because He loves you so much. We forget that. And I know I get the questions all the time. Rabbi, how do you explain the suffering, the pain of, of, the, of the masses? How do you explain the hala? I can't answer all those questions. But to me, there's a certain, there's a certain constants. Number one, do you believe in God? Or do you believe in the randomness of the universe, that it's all accidental? I choose to believe that there's a God. Do you believe in a God that is kind and benevolent or one that is cruel? That's your choice. I believe in a God that is benevolent and kind. And I could prove it to you. I could look at the world. It's beautiful. The world is beautiful. I mean, sunrise, sunset, the, 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 uh, the different colors in the sky, the, the beauty of, of fall emerging right now. If you haven't gone upstate yet right now, it's a beautiful time. Go to the parks. Go to Bear Mountain on a, on a short hike. Just look at how the seasons are changing. The color of the leaves is so beautiful. It's all there. It doesn't have to be that way. God didn't have to create a world of color. He didn't have to create a world with sound. He didn't have to create a world with taste and flavor. It's all there because this benevolent being wanted you to have pleasure. He wants you to have tov. He wants you to have good. But it's hard to feel that way when I, when I feel like I'm slighted and I'm in pain. It hurts. Why does it hurt? And therefore, you, I believe very deeply that when we are going through difficult times, that's Hashem setting you up for something more. I've seen it in my own life. And I'm confident everyone here will see it, Bezrat Hashem. They haven't yet. They will see it soon in their own lives. The Kutzker Rebbe says, whoever does not see God everywhere does not see Him anywhere. Can't see Him. 
How could you not see, how, how, do you, how do you go ahead and live in a world where you're not able to recognize God through every single instant, every single moment of time? What does God create? He creates beginnings. So we're in the month of Elul, and the month of Elul is about Teshuvah, okay? Um, and the Chachamim tell us that the way in which we're supposed to do Teshuvah is by creating an image in our mind of what it is we were meant to be. And therefore, the way in which you'll often hear about it is do something Shalom Lishma, and Shalom Lishma Ba Lishma. What does that mean? Shalom Lishma Ba Lishma. You do something for not the best of intentions, but if you keep doing it, eventually, you'll hopefully get to the right intentions. Does that really work? Can I really get you to go ahead and just do something that you don't really believe, and if you do it long enough, eventually you'll believe? And you know, the answer is it doesn't work. That's not how Shalom Lishma works. It's a mistake. The way Shalom Lishma Ba Lishma works is as follows. First, you have to have a clear picture in your mind's eye of what the Lishma looks like and where you want to be. And once you accept that as your mitzvah, your reality, I can do it without the right feelings and intentions, and in time, I'll get there. But if you don't really have that clarity of vision of what the Lishma part of you looks like, no matter how much the Lishma is there, you ain't going anywhere. It doesn't work. You can come to Beit Knesset, I'll come to synagogue, and I'll pray. Okay, great. Well, what's the goal of prayer? I don't have a goal. I'm hoping that if I keep going to synagogue, I'll figure it out. It doesn't work like that. The only way it works is by first clarifying where, are you, where do you want to end up? I love telling that story of Alice in Wonderland, yeah. right? You know, Alice is uh, walking down the path and she's stuck. She's at a crossroad and she has no idea where to go. She looks at the cat and says, cat, which way should I go? So the cat says, well, where do you want to go? And Alice says, well, I, I don't know. So then the cat says, then it doesn't really matter. If you don't have a clear vision as to where you want to end up, then what you do on a day-to-day basis is irrelevant. God sets you up, He creates the beginnings, and you choose where you want to take it. It's your story. You choose. But we get so caught up because we don't believe that things can change. Change, But we say, Yeshua Hashem Kerev Ein. We believe deeply that God's salvation can happen in the blink of an eye. Instant, to instant, instant, instant Yeshua. The altar of uh, Navardic says, a person should be willing to give up all of his tomorrows for one today. So he doesn't end up wasting all of his todays on one tomorrow. Right? What a beautiful quote. And what they're all saying is the same thing. Now is what matters most. Right here, right now. I had, uh, you know, uh, in the morning, uh, my morning class today, um, someone said something like, oh, you know, like we're not holy. Our generation, we're not holy. We're not like the people that lived like 3,000 years ago who had the schut of seeing, you know, uh, the, you know, Moshe take out the Jewish people and split the sea and the man and all that stuff. And you know what my response was? I'm like, that's not true. My response is that I think you're holier than the people that lived 3,000 years ago. Now you're going to ask me, like, why, why are you saying that, Rabbi? We don't have prophets. They had prophets. You know what my response is? They needed prophets. You don't need a prophet. They needed to see a temple with the offerings. They needed to see the ten plagues. They needed to see the, seeing of the, the splitting of the sea. The reason why you're not there is because that's not your challenge. You don't need that. Your challenge is right here, right now. If you and your neshama were born a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, it's too easy for you. You needed to be born in a time in history where you had the perfect amount of counterweight challenge to allow you to become the best you. That's why you're here right now. God creates beginnings. He plucked you out of all the timeline, the sacred timeline, and put you right here in 2024, in this particular room right here, right now, with these ladies. Because there's something profound, unique, that every single person here can express only with the challenge of this generation and no other time. Do you understand how holy you are? But we don't think of ourselves as being holy. I'm just a simple... Jew trying to survive, trying to get by, and that's the Satan making you feel small. But part of being an anav, part of being humble, is recognizing that you're so special and you're great. Do you, do you treat yourself like princesses? Are you really a queen? Are you dignified like that? Or are you just like everybody else? It's up to you. You decide. There was a, a man who was uh, going to collect money. He was poor, he could, had a hard time. He was a uh, his business fell apart, and um, he was at a point where he had to go ahead and collect it. There was one rich man in the town, so he decided he'll go there and wait. 
and it was late at the end of the day. There's a whole process of knowing when to go and how to ask. And this is his first time there, and like he just doesn't know what to do. And uh, you know, he gets there, and the butler's like, "Listen, you know, today we're, we're, we're closed today. We're not taking any more requests. You'll have to come back tomorrow." And he's sitting there. He moves away from the front door. He's standing there on the side. He's crying. He's like, "What am I going to tell my family? I have no food for them tonight. I have nothing to bring home." And as he's crying, he's sitting there. The maid decides that she wants to throw the trash out the window. She's too lazy to come outside, it's cold out. She takes the trash and she throws it out the window. And the bag falls on his head and the whole thing opens up on top of him. And he's like, ugh, why would God do this to me? I'm sitting here, now I got trash on me. And as he's flicking off all this garbage from him, you know what he notices? A little gem, a little diamond in the garbage that ended up on his lapel. Takes it off and he's like, ah! Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Takes this little gem, he goes and he sells it that night, and now, Baruch Hashem, he has enough money for the month, it's good. So uh, it's not enough for his whole life, but you know, he runs out of money again, he decides he's going to go back again. So he's waiting in the same spot he was waiting before. So some other collector looks at him, he says, uh, excuse me, sir, like, you, know, I'm, you might be new to all this, but like, you're not standing in the right place. You have to stand closer to the door over here, they won't see you. That the way you ask is you come over here. He's like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> the way you ask is you wait over there, right? And this is the mistake that we often make, right? Well, you think that, that your salvation comes from one space and you're going to go back exactly the same, same, same place again. Oh, right, that last time I went to that rabbi, rabbi and he gave me a blessing and everything was okay. I'm just going to go back. That's not how it works. If you have a certain type of salvation, okay, it, salvation only comes from the places that are where it's least expected. If you're expecting it, right, from that particular place, it ain't coming. Yeshua Hashem keheref ayin. You blink and it changes. Um, I, it's it's we're we're not too far. I think three weeks away from it being a whole entire year since October seventh. Can you imagine that? A whole year is flying by. Flying by. It's insane. It's been a crazy year. And I'm terrified to think about what happens post Rosh Hashanah, post October 7th. I get anxiety thinking about it. I, I was there three weeks after October 7th with a group from Safra. We went down there to do our volunteer work and to help and so on and so forth. It's painful. And honestly, not much has changed. And it's very easy to feel like maybe things just won't change. And that's a mistake. To be a Jew means to never abandon hope. That's what Yeshua Tashem Kerf Ayin means. The Gemara in Brachot says, if there is a sword on your neck, you can still do Teshuvah. There's Teshuvah again. We think of Teshuvah of like those people that are going out, like the born again. Like that's not what Teshuvah is. Teshuvah at its core is you actualizing what it means to, best, to be the best version of yourselves. That's what it is. The Torah is a system for peak performers that want to live a life of excellence. It's not designed for losers. It's not designed for weak-minded people. It's not designed for people that are, eh, I'll do it later, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll procrastinate. It doesn't work like that. And when you try to procrastinate and you try to go ahead and push it off, you know what ends up happening? Somehow it follows you. It comes back and it haunts you. Why? Because God wants you to grow and you're either going to grow by choice or, God forbid, circumstance, and they're both painful. Sometimes making choices, hard choices, are really hard. But circumstance, I think, is worse. I don't want to be forced to do something. Don't you want to be in that place where intellectually you're going to be like, no, I'm going to be a step ahead of this. I'm getting up. I have 40, I have less than, what is it now, like two, two, three, two and a half weeks to Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is what? What are we celebrating? The birthday of man. It is the birthday of Adam HaRishon. It's not about the change in the calendar. It's true we do cha change the calendar, but when we talk about 5784 right now, changing to 5785, that has nothing to do with the, 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 uh, the solar cycle on the earth. When we say 5784, we're talking about 5784 years ago is when Adam was born or created, however you understand Adam. Okay, that's when he has his epiphany that there's a God and he has Nevoah. And you and I as being the offspring of Adam, okay, what that really means is that you and I have the ability to, to transcend our lower physical selves 
to become something much more profound. Isn't it interesting that the Jewish people have been picked on for so long? Is that an accident? Why is that? Why is it that for so long in our history, Jews have been singled out for being all kinds of things? Why is that? Is, there, is it an accident that the Torah makes it very explicitly clear that the Jewish people are often going to be ridiculed and are going to be reminded of what it means to be a Jew? That there are circumstances that they're going to face that no other people on the planet will face? Is that an accident? That you and I are still here dealing with the same exact stuff that our grandparents, wherever they may be from, were dealing with back then? The same kind of anti-Semitism, but now even a little bit worse because of social media? Isn't that crazy? Who would have thought that? Ten years ago, would you imagine, if I would have told you ten years ago, that there are going to be American college students waving Hamas and Hezbollah flags on campus, and that's the norm. You'd be like, Rabbi, you're nuts. You're crazy. But I want you to know, I said it ten years ago. Yeah, I said it because I saw it happening already. Because when you live in a reality where it's not based on truths anymore, we could say, if you tell a lie long enough, that becomes your reality. I saw, we saw what was happening with Israel, lie after lie after lie after lie after the worst, the worst, the worst, the horrible. The BBC just got, uh, had that whole report where they said how, how I think it's something like when, 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 uh, is, when the BBC speaks about Israel, I think it's like 1,500 times more negative words associated with Israel in their press reporting than Hamas. Than Hamas, not the Palestinians, Hamas. That's insane. That's crazy. So when you say something long enough, you become, uh, give up. And people today are so weak-minded. They don't have the intellectual uh, fortitude, strength, stamina to search for truth. If I can't Google it, I can't find it, I don't want it. You know, I'm a very big believer in owning books. And I started buying more books once Wikipedia was put up on the internet. Why? Because I read Wikipedia pages that changed. They've edited them. Like that didn't say that before. Where did that come from? You know what that means? That means that you could alter truths. You can't change a book. I have it printed. I, I'm, t- I, I'm a very big believer that books will be banned again. We've gone through times in history where books were banned, and everything's going to be digital, and they want to have everything digital because you could control truth that way. Your books are priceless. You're sitting on a treasure trove of, uh, don't get rid of your books, don't sell them, hold on to them, and you teach your children that this is something they need to create for themselves. We need to have libraries to remind ourselves of truths that will be lost, God, God forbid, in the future. Okay, anyway, uh, Mishnah and Avot says, number four, Nitai Arbeli Omer, Hachek Mishachen Rav Al Tidchabel Rashav Al Titayesh Mina Puranut. He says that you should keep away from an evil neighbor and do not become attached to the wicked and do not abandon faith in the divine retribution. How are these different pieces of this Mishnah interrelated? Is there any correlation here? We're talking about positivity, and we've said many times that you are very much a product of your environment. And if you're hanging around bad people that are negative people, um, it's going to impact you. Many years ago, I had a very brilliant woman, Zipporah Heller, now Gottlieb. Uh, We were having a conversation about, I I often have interesting people show up at my Shabbat table, and... um, you know, so the question was, like, how much exposure should my children have? Um, so she said something to me once, like, if you want to turn your bedroom into a, a sanctuary for pigeons, don't be surprised if you smell like bird poop. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I think what she was saying was that, um, you know, yeah, you could do all, have whatever you want in your house, but be, be mindful, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact you and your family. It impacts. Now, I think it's okay. If what you're doing is chesed and you're trying to do good, it's okay sometimes to get dirty. And I, I want my kids to know that. And Baruch Hashem hasn't had a negative effect on my kids. Maybe my kids are out of the box and that's a problem for the community that they're in, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. You're closest to. This is very true. Baruch Atah, Shahakol, you are the average of the five people that you're closest to is very true. But Nitai Arbeli is saying, by the way, by the way, Nitai Arbeli, you know what we know what Arbeli is? Arbeli. That's Har Arbel. That's the mountain I was talking about. That's the hike that I go on. When I, ever, I often teach this Mishnah when I talk about going on Mount Arbel. Nitai Arbeli, he's from that region. Anyway, so, uh, but at the end of it, he says, even if you are surrounded by these bad people, don't give up, don't abandon hope. 
it's so easy to be surrounded by bad people and thinking that, oh, the world's garbage, it's bad. Yeah? But can't that, those bad people be actually the purification? Mm. What do you mean? Meaning, the fact that you're put in those situations. Uh, well, well we're, we're, he's saying if you have the ability of so keep, change. if you could change it. Obviously, if you're in a situation where, you know, you, you bought a, an apartment and it happens to be that you have some crazy person that lives, my in-laws live next to some, they, they, have, they live here in the city, and they have a very famous older actress that bought an apartment right above them, and she's absolutely crazy. She likes to tap dance late at night, and, uh, and like she's banking on the thing, and like she just screams at her lines in the middle of the night, like whatever it is. And they, I have these very cool letters that my father-in-law writes to her, you know, like just saying like, you know, Audrey Hepburn, you have to, st- <laughs> you have to stop with this nonsense. But anyway, so uh, she, um, he, uh, he, um, the idea is that yes, obviously sometimes you're stuck with a neighbor and that's God challenging you and testing you and so on and so forth. But if you have the ability of choosing the people that you're surrounding yourself with, you want to surround yourself with number one is people that are positive. You have negative thinkers around you, people that are always you know, reminding you how things are wrong, they're always pointing the bad things, stay away from them, that's like cancer. You want to stay away from them, that's carcinogenous. The Ikar Tosat Yom Tov, number five, says as follows, and, and do not, he says, and it does not say that he should not worry about the punishment. At the end, it says, it says, Al Titayesh Min HaPurinut, right? He says over there, and it does not say that he should be worried about the punishment, since such a thing is a bad trait. The one who worries about punishment, but rather do not despair, Al Titayesh, which is what Haman did when he relied upon his great wealth and in the blink of an eye, his success reversed itself upon him. And this is the meaning of the expression of do not despair, which means al So what's he saying over here? Uh, the, the story of uh, Esther and Haman, okay, took place uh, about um, 2,400 years ago, okay, in Persia. And um, what Haman had as far as ability and potential was to create a decree where he could have eviscerated, eradicated every single Jew on one day. Do you understand what that is? That's what, that's what the Purim story is about. The story of Purim is how there was a decree that was signed by this evil guy who was the second most powerful man in over, over 120 provinces, and he wrote out a decree that would give permission to the people of that particular uh, region to kill every single Jew on what's kill a Jew day. That's what he, he was signing the legislation. He had, Hamas wishes they had that ability. Okay? Hezbollah wishes they had that ability. Okay? Hitler would have wished to have that power. Those guys didn't have that ability, but Haman had it. Now, it's interesting that the story of Esther is told in what book? The Megillat Esther. And the word Megillah comes from the word Megale, right? To reveal. The word Esther comes from the word Hester, which means, to, which means hidden. Megillat Esther means to reveal that which is hidden. What's the hidden thing that is being revealed in the story of Purim? That God was behind the scenes. That's right. He was always there. You're freaking out. Oh my gosh, what's going on? It's horrible. It's terrifying. There's a killer Jew day on the calendar. It's, gonna, it's over. It, the story is coming to a fo- Everything is falling apart. And what does Hashem say? No. Boop. Here I am. You know where else you saw this idea, by the way, so beautifully? You see it by Miriam. When Miriam Hanavi confronted her parents, Right? Um, Amram and Yocheved got divorced. Amram divorced his wife. And he looked at her and he said, there's no point in having any more children. It's over. I'm going to divorce you, and therefore every other Jewish man will divorce their spouse, and we're going to, done. Closing shop. Whatever this experiment is to be the Jewish people, clearly God doesn't care. We're closing shop. It's over. How hopeless do you have to be? In what situation did you get to to feel that I'm just, I'm, it's just I'm, I'm so broken, I'm just closing shop. We're shutting everything down. We're breaking down the families. We're stopping all future generations. Can you imagine where these people were? We're talking about Amram, the head of the Jewish people. He was the leader. He wasn't some small guy. He was the head, the leader of the Jewish people in Egypt said, it's over. And Miriam, a 12-year-old little girl, says, Abba, what are you doing? Your decree is worse than Paro. And what she was really saying is, how dare you give up on hope? Maybe the boys will be killed. What about the girls? And that's the beginning story of all those midrashim that say that's beschut nashim said kaniot in the schut and the merit of the most righteous women. Okay, 
that Yeshua is going to come from. It comes from women who have a deeper understanding of hope than men. Men have a power, a connection to something called emunah. What does emunah mean? It's often translated as faith, but that's a poor translation. The word emunah means to be faithful. Emunah means to be faithful. What's the difference between having faith and being faithful? It's a big difference. Uh, what would the world look like if men were more faithful? <laughs> what would the world look like if our politicians were more faithful, if people were more faithful? But we give up, we abandon hope. They're not faithful to the hope, they're not faithful to truths. We want to do what's easy. And therefore, what he's saying over here, the Ika Yom Tov is saying on Perkei Avod, this idea is, don't, don't allow yourself to abandon hope. The word yush, right? Everyone know what the word yush means? Yush means the giving up on hope, to abandon hope. So the Gemara says that this, this, this concept in Gemara that says, um, if someone is, let's say, on a cruise, okay, and they're wearing their fancy Rolex, and their Rolex falls off their wrist and it falls into the ocean. Do you have any hope of reclaiming that watch? The answer is no. But if, let's say, your Rolex fell into a pond, right, is it possible for you to get back your watch? Yeah, so you're not mitayesh, you, know, you don't give up hope. And so the concept goes like this, lahalacha. this is a halachic principle. This is a legalese principle. So let's say you're walking down Central Park and now you find a, uh, a watch at the brink of the, 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 the bank of the pond. Can you claim it as your own? And the answer is, well, if it's a Rolex, the, the owner may have, it's still working, it's very possible they just lost it, probably gonna come back and look for it. And therefore, I have a responsibility of posting up signs saying, I found the watch over here. Look, call me, let me know. But let's say you found the watch, you're scuba diving, okay, and you're at the bottom of the Atlantic, and you find this Rolex. Is there any possibility that the owner would ever think of retrieving it? The answer is no. And therefore, since he is mitayesh, that person gives up hope on that watch, that watch becomes ownerless. But if you still have, if you haven't given up, then it's still yours. So we say there's a concept called yush shalom edat. He has yush that he's unaware of. Shalom edat means like he, you know, he is not, he hasn't yet given up on this this concept, right? And therefore, you know, it still may be his. But what we really say is, Yiush is Shalom Midat. When someone gives up, it's not coming from a place of thinking. There is no giving up. You're here because you come from mothers and grandmothers who never abandoned hope. You think you had it hard? We are so blessed. We have all the luxuries and we are living greater than every single king and queen that ever lived on this planet. You have more luxury and comfort. The simplest person in America has more luxury and comfort than any person before you. You are so blessed to have the things that you have. Instead of focusing on the things that you don't have, first start appreciating all the things that you do have. And be mindful that God loves you and that your reality can change in an instant. Why are you thinking about the past or the future? Why aren't you worrying about the present right here, right now? So these are 10 steps to transform persistent problems into positive outcomes, okay? These are 10 ideas. We're gonna go through them together, and uh, I'm gonna try to go through them fast. I have to get to Baruch College at two o'clock. So, um, and I think that the UN is in session today, and that's gonna be a lot of traffic. Okay, so 10, 10 steps. 10 steps to transform persistent problems into positive outcomes. Actually, it's 9-11 today. That's where all the traffic is. It's 9-11, not the UN. Next week, great. Okay, so number one. Acknowledge the problem. Recognize the issues that constantly perturbs you, be it unemployment, family strife, or children challenges, child rearing challenges. So number one is you have the way in which you could tackle any issues. If you can't articulate what the problem is, I can't help you. Can't help you. If you can't tell me, describe what the problem is, no one can help you. So the first thing is spend some time, quiet yourself down. Where, how can I articulate what my challenges are? What are my issues? What's holding me back? Write it out. Number two, stop obsessing over the problem, okay? You decide to stop constantly thinking about the issue, okay? You have to make that choice. And, and number three is strengthen your emunah, your faith, okay? How do you do that? How do you strengthen your emunah? The only way to strengthen your emunah is by going through that mantra. I believe that everything I go through in life is good, 
right? I say, hakol tova. everything is for the best. Gamzu tova. this too is all, everything is good. There is no bad in the world. There were Jews in concentration camps that were saying, gamzu tova. It's all for the good. I can't say that. I can't explain it. But you are put into a particular situation that you know more about than anyone else. You have a choice. You could see it through a negative lens or a positive lens. So strengthen your muna, strengthen your faith. That is going to be the thing that is the foundational power that allows you to overcome the situation. Number four, visualize solutions. Like I said earlier, shalom lishma ba lishma does not work unless you have a clear picture of what that final you looks like. Imagine what it's like to be stress-free. Imagine what it's like not to have the worry. Imagine what it's like not to have the anxiety. What does that version of you look like? Envision it, clarify it in your head. Create a picture in your mind's eye. What does that really, what does my life look like when I get rid of that midah? Number four, work towards your aspiration by dealing with solutions. Work actively towards realizing your goals. I hate it when people tell me about all the things that are bad. I had a couple that showed up yesterday in my office. They're having shalom bite issues. It's the fifth time they've come back to me. And um, the, the way the conversation always starts is one of them starts off by telling me everything that went wrong over the last eight months. I have to sit there like, this time he went on that night, and he went on this night. I'm like, oh my God, here we go. I'm sitting there with my, it's going to be a long night. And then at some point I become you know, impatient. I'm like, listen, you know, I really don't really care, obviously, about all the things that went wrong. I just need to know one thing. Do you want to fix this, yes or no? I'm not sure, Rabbi. I'm like, okay, I'm not sure I could help you. <laughs> That's all. It's very simple. And, and until you figure out whether or not you want, you know, until you can figure out, that, come back to me. I don't, I don't want to hear. You want to go ahead and tell some of your problems? Go find a psychiatrist that will help you listen to your problems. I don't want to do that. I'm about solutions. I don't want to hear about problems. Yes, sometimes we just stop and look at the reasons why we got to where we are right now and we've got to address it. But it, I find often a more profound way of therapy and helping people is not by dwelling on and figuring out the past. It's endless going backwards. It's much more profound in spending time and thinking more profoundly about, well, where am I going? And I have another, someone else who uh, I'm working with right now, a young guy, 21 years old, and um, you know, special, special kid. Um, he was uh, very, very obese in high school, like 350 pounds obese. Okay, and um, you know, he comes from an affluent family and he often wore brands you know, to conceal his own discomfort with his own, with his own uh, obesity. But irrespective, he was you know, bullied and made fun of and so on and so forth. And now he's lost a lot of weight and he's really handsome and he's getting a lot of uh, attention and it's, he doesn't know how to deal with it. And it's not, it's, it's destructive. Destructive? Yeah, it's destructive. Because now all of a sudden you have all the attention and you're a young man and, uh, and you have all that affluence and you have the, the wealth backing it up. You get all kinds of people coming after you and it's not, not a positive thing. It can become a very destructive thing. So how do you teach someone balance? How do you teach someone who's been so focused on superficiality as a way of getting out of his own you know, mental blocks to say that what you're doing is you're asking for, for more pain. Superficiality won't bring you meaning. And you really, he really wants meaning. How do you change that in a person? Uh, that's where I'm at right now with him. But the way in which I help him, because it often comes, we often come back to, well, Rabbi, you don't get it. Like, you know, I have a low self-esteem. I'm like, I don't care about your past. I don't care about how you got here. I care about right now and where you want to go. By the way, this is so important with our children. If you have kids and you're, you're, you're for, stop about the past. I don't care about the past. Where do you want to go? How can I help you right now get to where you need to go? Forget about what was. It's over. I can't change that for you. You have to let go. Start by getting them to visualize the solution and then work towards your aspiration. Then you've got to transform negative to positive. How do you do that? Right? You, you use the power of positive thinking to transform the current state from negative to positive one. Every situation that you find yourselves in, if you think it's negative, I promise you I can help you see the other side of the coin. It's your choice. I have, a, I, have a, I have a daughter who I love. I love all my kids deeply, but I have one who's very special. And she naturally tends to see things more negatively first. That's her natural inclination. She'll, always go, she'll go there first. So as a father, it's my responsibility to constantly remind her that that's where her mindset is. And that she has a responsibility of switching that and thinking and trying to see the positive first. 
I don't make an issue out of it. I'm like, oh, there you go again. And I have like a whole shtick with her, right? And Baruch Hashem, she's in 12th grade right now, and she's finally getting it. She's aware of herself. It's that self-awareness, but, it's, but more important, the self-awareness is fueled by, I don't want to be that bitter, angry, negative person. I don't want to be that person that's always complaining and thinking about all the things that are bad. I want to be that happy person that sees the good in all things. I don't want to see all the negative in, all the, in, in, the, in the world. I'm not saying you should ignore negative things. I'm just saying that you have, when you live your life, you can choose to see the struggle as something that is negative or positive that's on you. So you transform negative to positive. Number four, reduce pressure with positive thoughts. What does that mean? Well, ugh, it's so difficult. I'm, I'm, I have to get here, traffic. Uh, you know, I have to prepare for my class and 15 people ask me annoying questions. You know, whatever it is, like you start, but it's, it's, it's all a bracha. It's all a blessing. Stop thinking of it from negative, change the negative thinking into positive thinking. Number eight, increase your bitachon. Trust in the situation, let go. Stop trying to control things. You can't control things. Sometimes Hashem says, let go, let me, let God. That's what he wants from you. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to trust in him. And number four, anticipate positive outcomes. If you don't believe at the end that there's Yeshua Tashem Keheref Ayin, if you don't believe that God's salvation comes in the blink of an eye, none of this works. You could do all the work, but if you don't believe that transformation is real, Lishma doesn't happen. This whole thing is Shalom Lishma, but at the end, if you don't believe that the, the positive outcome will become a reality, you, my friends, are stuck. Questions? Number seven, Talmud Barachot says, whoever tries to manipulate his fate will eventually be put, 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 pushed aside, but whoever bends to Hashem's will will overcome his fate. Hashem wants to see how uh, a patient a person is and whether he is willing to alter his approach to life by recognizing that the affairs of this world do not revolve around his desires, but rather that they run according to a Kaddish Baruch Hu's grand design. Are you someone who's trying to change the world that God has created, or are you willing to kind of like go with the flow and see things positively? The Chida, number seven, we hope for the salvation throughout the day. This refers to Yeshua Hashem Kedatayin. This refers to the coming of Mashiach. Every one of us has a hope constantly for the uh, to, to hope constantly for the ultimate redemption of our nation and look forward to His own personal redemption. At, we believe at the end of time we're all going to be redeemed. And when Navi says it, Navi says Hashem says, "Don't worry about it. You will be redeemed from your exile." It's going to happen. Now, it depends on how it's going to happen. It happens either if we are kulo zakai, if we're all notorious, if we have merits for it, or, or God forbid, if we're all reshaim, if we're all evil and there's no choice. If we're all evil, the reason why God has to save us is because the exile no longer matters. The system is broken. The system that God set up to challenge us, to allow ourselves to become great, isn't working anymore. So he's got to save you. But if you are a zakai, which means, if you're worthy, that means that you're allowing the history that we're flowing through together, and you're using it to maximize your lives. Maximize it. Embrace it. Embrace who you are. Embrace the situation that you find yourselves in. Don't be bitter about it. It's what defines who you are. <coughs> it's the power, the energy that it allows you to express the best, 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 best version of you. So how do you realize your goals to solve your problems? Number one, tap into the power of prayer. Tefillah means, right, to be someone who is introspective. Pilel, to introspect. That's what the word tefillah means. Looking inward first. You don't find solutions externally. Solutions are often found inside. Pnimiyut, inner, inner, not outer, not chitzoniyut. Fill your mind with positive thoughts. Focus not on the problems, but on solutions. Imagine positive outcomes for your aspirations. Create a tranquil environment. You want to sit down every single day. I have this thing that I do right now in the month of Elul. It's called Selichot. Okay? Um, and, you know, first of all, you're all invited to come. There's a ladies section here. And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, there's a huge amount of women in the morning that come to Selichot. Yeah. There are three Selichot here in the morning. Yes, there's one at um, 5.45, there's one at 6.45, and one at 7.15, right? Uh, the 7.15 and 6.45 are the ones that have most of the girls, and most of the girls are coming from Stern. Right? They're coming here in the morning, we have a whole section for, for them, and they're packed, they're saying slichot. Why? They found a space, they want to use this end of the year, this time, to go ahead and to be in this place where they're filling themselves up with, with positive thoughts that, yes, I can change, I can grow. All the songs that we're singing, everything about the slichot itself is all there to be positive. 
You, that's, the, this is the greatest line, ready? The Kutzker Rebbe said once, he says that, people think that Jews walk away from their belief because they found some philosophical issue that they're struggling with. He's like, that's not true. He's like, a Jew walks away from his Judaism simply because they are depressed. They what? They're depressed. Mm -hmm. Judaism requires some level of positive happiness. If you're broken and you're sad, you can't connect anything. You're locked. It's, you're, you close yourself in. And this is why the mitzvah is mitzvah tamid lihiyot besimcha. It's a mitzvah to always be besimcha. You can't connect to God. If you're a navi, if you're, if you're a prophet, you can't get prophecy when you're sad. Saul, Shaul, had to hear music to get himself out of his depression, to allow himself to connect to God. And it was a vicious cycle for him. He's like, why am I not connected to God? And he made himself crazy. But it's when you recognize, you let go and let God in. And you recognize that it's all for the good. I'm just playing my part. I have a role to play. We're all playing in a massive, massive Broadway show. And the question is, every single morning, God creates the beginning. How are you going to end the show? How are you, how are you, how are you going to express your lines today? Are you going to allow the best version of you to express itself? Or are you going to allow the weakest version of yourself to express yourself? Are you working on yourself to be the strongest version of yourself? Are you, are you inoculating yourself? Are you going in and giving yourself the, the, the spiritual vaccine through limud, learning, and inspira inspiring yourselves to have that strength and the power in the morning to deal with your reality? If you're not, don't be surprised if you see the world in a very negative lens. And don't be surprised if the people around you aren't impacted by the negativity. You become the wicked neighbor to your family. Do you want that? Who wants to be that person? I don't want to be the source of, of that negativity in my family. You become the wicked neighbor. Don't become the wicked negative neighbor. The word negativity comes from the Hebrew word nega. Nega means affliction. Negativity is an affliction. Right? Okay, so he says, forget, the, forget problems and reducing, create a tranquil environment. Number two, number three, he says, four over here is forget problems and reduce anxiety. By focusing on positive thoughts, you can reduce anxiety and pressure. Trust in Hashem's help and plant your seeds in Hashem's field. Strengthen your thoughts and beliefs. Trust and belief in Hashem. Number 11, it says, This is the verse that talks about at the end of time, God will ensure that we are all redeemed. So no matter how much you mess it up, God loves you so much, He's going to help you figure it out. But I don't want to be the, the needy child at the end that gets a freebie. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a term called the nama de kisufa, which uh, means the bread of shame. Anyone know here what the bread of shame is? What is it? You receive something and you didn't work for it. But what, 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 what are we talking about the bread of shame? Why is it called the bread of shame? The bread of shame is from the man. The man that we received for 40 years in the desert is called the bread of shame. Why is it called the bread of shame? Because you didn't earn it. Hashem doesn't want to give you freebies. There's nothing more profound than being empowered to know that I did this. I chose this. And therefore he creates a reality with challenge that empowers you to be you. He doesn't want you to do just everything he says perfectly. He doesn't want you to be in a, a robot and an angel. He creates the obstacle because the greatest thing he could give you is the power of independence. The founding forefathers of this country understood that. Freedom and independence are so profound. It's what makes us human and makes us greater than the angels. How do we decide how the year ends? Well, that's up to you. First, create a picture in your head of what you want this year to look like. Number two, ask yourselves, what are the things that are holding you back? Number three, ask God for the strength to overcome it. And number four, believe that your reality will change. That's it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> number one is create an image of who, what you want this year to look like. Number two is uh, articulate what are those things that are holding you back from making your image a reality. Number three is ask God for the strength to overcome those challenges. And number four is believe that your reality will become your reality. Believe that, they, that your reality will become true. That's all you need to do, my friends. By the way, those are really, you know where I got that from? I got it from Harambam. The three steps of Teshuvah is number one, is acknowledging that you made a mistake. Number two, I'm never doing it again. And number three is asking God for forgiveness. It's the same thing. It's all there. So Bezrat Hashem, as we continue the conversation, this is about believing that Yeshua Hashem can have ayin. 
that your reality can change in an instant. You're not stuck. You are never stuck. Ain ye oosh. There's never giving up. Two quotes, to, when we'll end the class with those two quotes. Number, number one, the darkest hour has only 60 minutes. And number two is, hope is being able to see that there's light despite all of the darkness. Never, ever give up. Yeshua Tashem, Kev Ayn. Hashem will pick up next Wednesday. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you.